Hello, my name is BJ Paris. Welcome to Tapping Into His Treasures. Today's a special welcome to York County, Pennsylvania. And I know my show has been on your station for a little while now, but I haven't had the time to give you a proper introduction. So here I am. I moved from Maine to Pennsylvania just three weeks ago. And with all the packing and everything, uh, and getting settled in, and I'm going to tell you more about that moving story and all the problems we faced in just a little while. But for now, uh, I just want to tell you a little bit about myself and a uh, little bit about my life story, and mainly that's what our show is going to be about today. So, and um, I have to have a new background and everything in my new apartment, so it took me a little while to get it all straightened out with the fireplace behind me. My pretty uh, Japanese cherry blossoms here, and my uh, gladiolas over on this side, so I hope it all turns out okay. So, just need to catch my breath. So, I'm from Connecticut originally, where I married and had four sons. My former husband was from Maine, so we ended up coming to Maine. Um, in the early 70s, I think it was 1971. I mean, going to Maine, I, my mind thinks I'm still there. We ended up going to Maine in 71. We were there for a long time. And um, uh, we were hurting, we didn't have very much. But the great good thing that we did have, the wonderful thing that we had, that our kids were raised as country boys and they had to uh, chop wood for the fire and carry the old fashioned um, kerosene jug to, invert it and put it uh, next to the stove so it would drip and provide us, drip into the stove and provide us heat. You know, that's what we burn for heat. And we had a, a, lo a long, long, like not an acre long, but it was long garden, which the boys helped to um, harvest so that we could have food to take us through the winter. And the boys dug their own clams starting when they were about four or five years old and sold them so that they could buy school clothes. Um, Oh, they went fishing. We ate a lot of fish in those days. Um, but along with working at early ages, they also had a good time because the granddad bought them a snowmobile, so they were able to go snowmobile in the wintertime, um, tobogganing. Later on when we built our house, we had a great big field with a slope, so they'd be out there until midnight when there was no school the next day, tobogganing on the hill. Um, and lots of sports, uh, including ice fishing and the things that Maine, Maine boys do. So fast forward, the boys grew up and they got married. And they gave us some wonderful, wonderful grandchildren. And they married, um, uh, three of them married women with uh, children already. So they gave us uh, a new family of wonderful, wonderful grandchildren. Now we're up to up to 25, um, I think it's 23 grands and two great grands. So we're very excited about that. So another fast forward was that our, uh, our marriage ended after 30 years and that was a very devastating time. And God resurrected that as he always does in our lives. And uh, I went to, um, I moved to Pennsylvania not Pennsylvania, that came later, Maryland, um, and went to a Bible school there. And I was there uh, two times, um, three and a half years the first time and six and a half the other time, so it was just short of 10 years that I was in uh, Maryland. And then in uh, 2006, I went back to Maine and got to enjoy my family. Uh, who I've been craving and missing for a long time. and I mean, I would <clears throat> come up, I, I traveled from Baltimore to Maine and back 39 times, so I did get to see them intermittently all those, all those years. But anyway, this was like on a full-time basis. I was only um, an hour away from them. And at one point, I was in the same town as one of the boys and some of the grands. So, my life, 
my life uh, has consisted of a great deal of suffering and trouble, and I've had many uh, health issues, including severe scoliosis, which I've had all my life. When I was um, a young teenager, I actually had five different body casts, the old-fashioned plaster body casts. Some of you may remember those. It would start up here by my chin and go all the way down to my hips. And in between body casts, I had two um, back surgeries at ages 14 and 15. So, unfortunately, this condition has gotten progressively worse. And where I am today is uh, uh, the spine is at a 70 degree angle, and I'm bent over. You can't tell with me sitting down, and people often ask me, you don't look like anything's wrong with you. Well, trust me, there is. <laughs> so I, I, I'm kind of bent over when I walk and use a cane and uh, walk when I'm around the yard. Excuse it. I have the clock there not knowing it was set because I have to give myself just um, not more than 29 minutes for the uh, public, ac public access station. So let me continue here. So... Um, Oh, and they also told me that uh, with, with, the, with the bones bending the way they are, uh, they're hitting other body organs and causing just a variety of problems. But the big problem that we're facing now is, I'm facing now, I should say, is if they go over much farther bones uh, and they touch my heart at all, it's going to be all over for me because I can't survive that. But, you know, when you have God, I know where I'm going, I'm going to heaven, and um, I just trust Him. I'm not going to spend my days worrying about it. So, my boys and I have escaped injury and serious injury and death over a hundred times during our lifetimes, and they're all documented. Someplace on my computer, I've had a couple of computers, but someplace out in cyberspace they are documented. Um, Certainly years ago, they were all documented with doctor's offices. But um, with all the years that have gone by, uh, I'm sure they're no longer available. But God knows, maybe sometime in eternity, he'll be able to do a little video for you guys of all those documentations. And uh, I'd like to add, for the, by the grace of God, he saved us and spared us all those times. So I accepted Christ as my Savior in 1971, six months after the uh, birth of my youngest son. And um, I'll just tell you very briefly how that happened. I came from a very uh, religious background, went to a parochial school for nine years, and loved God with all my heart and soul for all those years, took the Holy Communion and sang to Him. Um, but I didn't know Christ in a personal way until my baby was six months old, and my neighbor had a baby who was just a little older. Maybe that baby was six months old when I gave birth to my baby. But she and I took our babies to the library in their little infant seats. And when I was there, I saw this great big coffee table Bible. As a matter of fact, I have my Bible is right here next to me. Let me just show it to you. This is my coffee table Bible. It's so heavy. And this is how, uh, this came from the Billy Graham Foundation years ago. Uh, this is what the Bible looked like that I saw in the public library that day. Oh, that's so heavy. And uh, I said to my, my neighbor friend, I said, oh my gosh, I never, I've never read the Bible in my life because my church didn't want us to read it on our own and like privately interpret and things like that. And I said, I have got to borrow this, I have to. And then I, I said to her, gee, I hope I don't go to hell for, for, for disobeying, you know, what I was told not to do as far as reading it on my own. And I, I had to go for it, so I borrowed it, took it home, and I couldn't wait to delve into it. And I was sitting in my little, little dining room, and when I came to the part, let me back up for a second. My mother's friend's husband told my mom to tell me not to start in the Old Testament as a first-time reader but to start with the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which I did. And then when I got to the part about Jesus' uh, crucifixion, it really hit me hard, and I just fell on my face on my kitchen floor. And I talked to God 
from my heart, my soul. And I said, you mean you're really, really there, God? Because all this time, I was like praying and singing to somebody who was just a figure of my imagination. I didn't know there was a, li a live, live person listening to me and hearing me all those years. So I said, all those years I've been praying to you, you actually heard me and were listening to me. I, I just couldn't fathom it. And uh, having read the part about Jesus going through that horrible suffering and torment and crucifixion, it just broke me, busted me all up. And I felt bad and sorry. So I apologized to him for all my sins. And I asked him to take me someplace where I could, I didn't know the word fellowship at the time, but where I could be with other people who felt about God the way I did because all my life I had been made fun of, especially as a young adult, made fun of like Looney Tunes, uh, which God knew that, no, knew that I wasn't and that many people loved God the way I, I did. So God answered that prayer. God answered that prayer and he took me away from Connecticut and he took me to our family to Maine and we happened to move just right down the street from a Baptist church and I happened to get a, a job with the newspaper doing the town news. I did become a, a, not an anchor, but a news reporter after that, but I started out right at the, the bottom as a correspondent. So that's what got me into that church to call, to get news from them. And, and here I am 49 years after finding that church and um, I'm still going strong for the Lord. And I feel a sneeze coming on. Oh my. Excuse me one second. So, here we go. Okay, when I accepted Christ as my Savior, one of the things I asked for early on was for the Holy Spirit to give me a keen sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. And He did, and that's one of the most precious gifts that I've ever been given. And He's also given me a ministry of godly testimonies. And yep, we, we tend to think of our testimonies as ours, but the Bible says that they're God's testimonies. I love that, the way the Bible says that. So he's called me to share my testimonies and his testimonies through writing books, which I've written several already, self-published, and speaking to women's groups off and on uh, during all the years, counseling for like 35 years, and uh, sharing on Facebook, which has been a lot of fun. So, and then in 2010, uh, God called me to share my testimony on public access TV when I was still in Maine. And uh, that like scared the heck out of me. I just didn't want any part of it. I obeyed God. I sent in my information. And then I had to go away for three weeks because there was something serious in the family in Connecticut. And when I came back, I was in my living room and, you know, watering my plants that were pretty dry at that time. I was gone for three weeks. And the TV was on and I'm watering plants and all of a sudden I saw myself on TV. It was awful. It was so awful. I just felt like digging a hole and jumping in and covering myself with sand or something. I, I did not like that at all because I'm a, I was a private person. I just didn't want my life exposed like that. And uh, I had a real problem with it. And God had it through the Holy Spirit orchestrated this. The, the very next day, I had an email come through from a dear friend. And it was one of those that you, you share with somebody. He didn't write it himself. He was just passing it on. He probably passed it on to 20 or 30 all at the same time on email. And what it said was, um, whatever it is that you're afraid of, Embrace whatever it is that you're afraid of. Well, I took that right from heaven. And, and what I was afraid of or didn't like was the TV show. And God told me through that email to embrace it. So I did. I embraced it. Uh, not wholeheartedly, but I just, through obedience, I embraced it. And uh, as time went on, uh, I started to embrace it with my heart a little bit more. And of course, now I'm a different person. It's like my life, you know. Uh, so anyway, yeah, I started out with maybe five or six stations, and then I graduated and went to maybe 10 or 11 stations. And now, oh my gosh, uh, there's no way I could count them now. Cause, what do you call that? One of my stations from Maine, 
uh, went digital, so so their shows go all over the country. And my girlfriend was down in Baltimore one day a few months ago, and it was evening, maybe 10:30 at night. And she tells me the next day that she watched us on TV because she came up. I did. I interviewed her because she was the president of something. I, D-A-R in Maine, Daughters of American Revolution. So I was interviewing her, and then we incorporated uh, uh, the scriptures in the Bible into the interview. And she saw it down there, and I didn't have a station down there. I had no station managers down there, so so I just never know where, where the shows are going to pop up. As a matter of fact, the books that I've written, you n I never know where they're going to pop up because I've had them. I've had people tell me on Facebook that they found... I guess one person was a relative, and she found my book through a friend of hers who found it at some kind of an auction in a different... They were in Connecticut, but it was in a different state. They found it at an auction maybe in New York. So it's like I never know where they're going to pop up. So I thought that was kind of interesting. So let's see. Okay. So this is the next part is about God leading me to Pennsylvania. So here I was, uh, still in Maine, and my health wasn't good. Um, my back condition was getting worse, uh, and I was a choker. Uh, my sister and I have very narrow openings in our esophagus, and I think my mother did too when she was alive. Um, so I would even, I wouldn't only choke on food. I've had to call 911 before a couple of times. I would also choke on my own saliva, and I would lose my breath. Till I just couldn't breathe. I thought I was dying over and over again. Therefore, I didn't want to travel anymore. So, you know, where I used to travel to Connecticut to see my relatives once or twice every year, for years and years and years, I just stopped completely, so they had to come and see me. I was afraid to go any place except I drove to the Walmart every day, which was six minutes away. And maybe a couple more things, you know, church. Not very far. The bank. I went to the bank once a month. I went to get gas. But I was afraid to go anyplace else for, like, years. So all of a sudden, God's leading me. <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> Pennsylvania. I thought I was going to the grave. So here he leads, is leading me to a different state. And I'm going, this is, like, crazy. I happened to connect with an old friend from Bible school uh, who had also been born and raised in Connecticut and, that was a, Connecticut, and that was our connection. And he became a pastor, and he pastors a church in Manchester, Pennsylvania. So uh, we were online as friends and in prayer groups for several months uh, after the pandemic started. And... Uh, so anyway, I, God was leading me to come and to be a part of his church because I hadn't been in a part of my, my church in Baltimore that's affiliated with the Bible school. I had not been affiliated with, with that church. As far as going, I was too far away to go every week, so I would watch the service online. So um, to, the thought of becoming a part of a branch ministry of that church in Pennsylvania was just so wonderful. I, it started to excite me, even though there were real things pressing at the same time. So, um, so I started to think about it more and more, and I finally obeyed God. He gave me so many signs over maybe 24 to 30, two and a half to two and a half dozen signs or something to that effect. And there was no mistake. So I, I started to follow through on obeying Him. So, um, my kids, of course, my grown sons, weren't and still aren't happy about my moving, especially with the pandemic. And, uh, you know, it was bad enough in Maine, but there were so many more people living in Pennsylvania. And they just thought if I came here, they were never going to see me again. And my heart aches for them, you know, still, still, they're getting more used to it because I'm keeping in touch with them a lot. I told them I was going to keep in touch with them so much they're going to get sick of me keeping in touch with them, but I'm going to do it because I care, uh, especially at my age, you know, over the hill. <laughs> so I wasn't going to come. I started packing back in September because I had come to Pennsylvania for a visit.
just to get the feel of it back in August. And I just met so many new people here, missionaries and church members and different branch ministries, and I, I loved it. So as soon as I got home, beginning of September, I started to pack. And when the, like, I guess you call it the second strain of the, vi the COVID virus hit, I, I was getting nervous. So I thought, well, let me wait until spring. I'll wait six months and see what happens with the, the corona, um, COVID. And what happened was uh, a 90 year old lady in the church had a stroke and she couldn't go back to her apartment and she had to go to a nursing facility. So, the, so my pastor approached them telling them I was looking for a place and the closer to the church, the better, because I've always, I've always been located a long way. It took me an hour to get to church or 45 minutes, da da da, -da. So anyway, he approached the family, the son and the daughter, and they gave me the rent. So we became friends over the uh, Facebook, um, writing back and forth to each other, even before I met them. So the thing of it was, um, it was this apartment I'm in now in Pennsylvania, Manchester, is only two miles from the church, which is right up my alley. So I just couldn't give it up. So instead of waiting the six months, um, I made plans to move right away. Um, somebody graciously, somebody from the pastor's ministry in Manchester graciously offered to come and to move me with the U-Haul and to tow my car. Uh, and I couldn't understand somebody doing that. He didn't want any money. Of course, you know, I, my feeling I made him take some. Um, but he just wanted to serve God in a new capacity. And I, thought, I was really impressed with that. So moving day comes, my, one of my sons and his neighbor loaded up the U-Haul, um, which is very expensive. And my son actually paid for that, $900 for that U-Haul. Oh my gosh. I don't know what I would have done. I was like shocked when they found out how much it was gonna cost. And what happened was they loaded up the U-Haul and drove it down to my son's house. And um, I, I straightened everything out with my management company and my housing complex, and I had I paid somebody to go in after I moved to clean clean everything spotless and shampoo the rugs all that, and I would sleep over my son's house. No, I slept over my girlfriend's house near my son's house for two nights. So what happened was, all of a sudden, the day that I was going to the airport, because I was going to meet the U-Haul driver down there, we get a snowstorm in Maine and all throughout New England. So we're driving to the airport. My girlfriend's a good driver, but still in all. We drove on the highway in a whiteout. You couldn't even see in front of you. We had to follow the plow truck in order to get from Topsom to Portland. Next thing that happened is that I was in that airport for seven hours. Maine had 21 inches of snow in that, on that day. They kept, I had one flight, they canceled it. Two flights, they canceled it. Three flights, and they canceled it. So I think it was the fourth flight, took off at seven o'clock at night, and I said, first my girlfriend and I were gonna get a hotel, because she couldn't drive in that. But when it calmed down after a few hours, she felt like she could drive home. So she went home, and I said, I'm sleeping at this airport. This, I'm not leaving this airport. I don't care if I have to sleep on a couch in the airport. I've done it before. I'm just going to stay here. So I did, and sure enough, at 7 that night, um, there were only 15 passengers on, on the plane. Um, and we flew to uh, Baltimore, and I had friend, friends, pick, uh, pastor friend and another friend pick me up at the Baltimore BWI airport. Uh, we stopped for something to eat in the car. And we ate in the car and uh, practiced social distancing, have been practicing social distancing and got to this residence at 11.30 at night, and the landlady had a basket of fruit on the table, a breakfast casserole for me for the next morning, milk and sugar, all the essentials that I needed. She had it decorated with a Christmas tree. They had been just absolutely wonderful to me. Gave me a big hug to boot, and um, I don't want to miss anything, let's see. Oh, so the other thing is that, um, 
Um, I didn't take my suitcases on the plane. I just took a backpack because I figured I was going to be there the, the next day to have all my essentials. It didn't happen. So I had hired some people to help. Oh, oh, the U-Haul driver got stuck in Connecticut because the Connecticut closed the roads down due to the snowstorm. He had to sleep in the truck in a Walmart parking lot in Connecticut. The next day he traveled to Pennsylvania, gets to the residence. The, the landlord's snowblower broke down. The driveway, long, long driveway, is all ice. They couldn't get the truck in. So the three guys carried just a few pieces of furniture in from the long driveway. And half of the stuff stayed in the U-Haul. The other half, the pastor allowed them to put it in the church and the nursery. I was here with hardly anything for days and days and days. It was awful, absolutely awful. Well, I'm not gonna dwell on that anymore. It's over and done with. So, um, eventually, I think it was maybe, oh, it was when the, maybe a week later, I did get hire somebody to um, take the, things off of the truck, the half of the truckload to bring inside. I had to pay extra, and then I had to hire the U-Haul for an extra day. So it ended up costing me a bundle over and above what my son had paid and all my other expenses. Um, and then maybe a couple of weeks after that, the first guy and his son, they brought all my, the rest of my stuff from the church nursery and brought it here. So eventually I did get all unpacked and I'm all settled in, praise the Lord. So now I'm just facing all the other stuff like changing my address and changing doctors and pharmacy and re-registering re -registering my car and plates and dealing with motor vehicles and all those things. And I'm telling you, it's just doing a number on my mind. It's not fun, I can tell you emissions test and inspection. Um, I got lost two times already. So mind boggling for sure. So God has led me one step at a time and he's gonna continue to lead me. I know the wonderful part is being a part of a church body once again from the church I've been affiliated with all these years. And um, you know, I've gotten accustomed acclimated to new areas before and it'll happen again just have to be a little patient and in addition to uh, being with all my new church friends um, your Comcast channel 16 station manager has been absolutely wonderful to me Cliff so hey Cliff thank you so much and I'm just hoping that I get a chance to meet you uh, you know quarantine's over now um, but, uh, I'm still not tr going far. I'm home in this house most of the time. But I certainly in the future want to meet many of you. So if you see me in the stores, or Walmart or Wee's or whatever the stores are around here, uh, come up and say hi. I'm just this little tiny thing and you'll recognize me right away. I went from um, from being short, a little short Italian to being diminutive, diminutive to looking like a little dwarf now. But anyway, my heart's big, and uh, I just have so much love for everybody. So come up and say hi, okay? I'd love to meet you. We could social distance. 